The fact is, this is an everybody issue. This is a whole community issue, and it's going to take the whole community to solve it. And anyone who thinks that they can sit it out, I think, may not understand the depth of the problem or how it affects them. So Dr. Desmond's willingness to come and share that with us has been illuminating. And these gentlemen who have come here today, I expect will be equally or more illuminating. They put me here in charge of a finance panel. I'm a therapist. <laughs> However, my dad was a banker, um, and uh, that may be one of the reasons I'm not. And, but I, I, I appreciate the work that uh, all these folks are doing. So I'm just going to take a moment and introduce them, and then we're going to get started. I'm gonna, I have some, uh, some questions for the panel, and then I definitely want to open it up uh, and take whatever deep dives y'all would like to take. Uh, I want to introduce Pat Carver. Um, uh, Pat is a City of Asheville resident, supporter of housing needs in our community. He's been in the financial services industry for over 25 years and has been involved in affordable housing needs for over 20 years in the greater Atlanta area, Asheville metro area, eastern Tennessee, Tri-Cities area. He's passionate about serving our communities, he currently provides board support and leadership positions with MHO, AB Tech, the Chamber of Commerce, the UNCA Foundation, the Industries for the Blind. He's been affiliated with Neighbor Works America for over 18 years, uh, which is a federally chartered nonprofit that supports community development in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. You have a lot of work to do. Pat is currently the area executive for First Citizens Bank and has responsibilities for banking operations in Asheville across northwestern North Carolina as well as East Tennessee. Um, next to him is Brian Gompers who uh, grew up in Newport News, and he uh, played college soccer at Pfeiffer University and incidentally got a degree at the same time. Um, he's been involved in commercial banking for 31 years, uh, 10 years of that with Wachovia. Some of y'all may remember that bank. Um, 10 years with Carolina First and TD Banks, where he was a senior commercial and middle market lender. And he's now with Home Trust, where he's helping local businesses and developers. Uh, married to Leanne, a ballet director at uh, Weaverville Dance Academy. Uh, two sons in college, and they're also a guardian for Ezekiel, a Liberian-born, now-adopted U.S. citizen who lives with them and attends Asheville Christian Academy as a senior. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Both sons are Eagle Scouts, I understand. Uh, Brian's an assistant high school soccer coach and also a soccer referee, serves on the board of the Western Carolina Rescue Ministries and the UNCA Foundation Board. Um, Jeff just got up, so he doesn't get introduced. I'm going to move over here to Lacey. <laughs> uh, this is Lacey Cross. Lacey's a commercial banker for Integra Bank, which is a community bank that has offices in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, he's been in banking since graduating from here at UNCA with a major in monetary finance and economics. Uh, started his career with a community bank in South Carolina prior to returning to Asheville to manage a mortgage company. And during his 20 years in banking, he was one of the founding employees of High Street Bank, which later merged with Capital Bank. And after 10 plus years in the mortgage industry, he moved into the commercial and construction lending arena. He's continued his banking career with large regional banks like First Citizens Bank and new startups like Old Town Bank. He's involved with several boards like the Carolinas Virginia Risk Management Association Regional Board, Land of the Sky Board of Realtors, Art Space Charter School Foundation, and the American Bankers Association Commercial Real Estate Committee. Y'all make some hard acronyms. Um, Lacey enjoys spending time speaking on panels. <laughs> He's been married to an Asheville native for the past 20 years and has two kids. Um, thanks for being here, Lacey. And last but not least, Jeff Stoddinger. Is there anyone in here who doesn't know Jeff Stoddinger? Okay, we got a couple. I'll do the intro. Um, <laughs> a man who normally needs no introduction. Um, he's been a community development practitioner since uh, he started off as a VISTA volunteer 100 years ago. Um, he, thereabouts. Um, he organized and led one of the first rural neighborhood housing services programs in the country, directed the work of a 30-town regional economic development organization, and reorganized and directed a regional affordable housing development organization and community land trust that was a member of the National Neighbor Works Network. Jeff served as community development director for the city of Asheville and then went on to serve as assistant director of the community and economic development department. Jeff's work with the city of Asheville focused largely on affordable housing policy development and funding, and he retired this past June, um, leaving this uh, enormous institutional knowledge gap that's going to take us decades to recover. 
Um, he served on the original board of directors of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. He was president of the Vermont Community Enterprise Fund, co-chair of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Coalition, president of the North Carolina Community Development Association. He's currently the past president. And uh, he's trying to learn fiddle tunes on his guitar. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Did you get set up, Jeff? Yes, sir. Um, so I just wanted to open it up today with uh, kind of a, a simple set of questions, and y'all can kind of take this in whatever order you'd like. Y'all just grab this mic from me. Um, so I'm curious about your institutions, uh, how you're involved in affordable housing currently, and how many units of affordable housing you've been involved in helping to support or create in this area over the last, let's say, five years. I'll go ahead and kick us off then. Um, over the past five years, really, I mean, the, one of the things I actually want to start with is my involvement with Mountain Housing. I know Scott Dedman spoke a little bit earlier. I've been the board chair twice there, and um, one of the things we noticed in our community, though, is when we have needs, we tend to go out the community and raise funds, or we try to find different ways to make it happen. Um, I had experience in the past with NeighborWorks organization, and it's a federally chartered uh, CDC out of uh, Washington, D.C., and one of the things that I think we did really well for our community was there were federal funds that were out there and they were not being used in our community. We reached out at that time and uh, joined, uh, had uh, MHO become a member of NeighborWorks and the one affiliate here. Since that time frame, probably about six, maybe right around your time frame, Gordon, um, we have ejected another $1.4 million from federal funds into our community. That's resulted into over 1,000 affordable units. So, and that's not money that we had to go and essentially raise locally or tax locally or do it, but we fi we're finding different ways to do that. So that's one of the things, Gordon, that I've really taken a lot of uh, pleasure in doing and supporting our community that way. Um, secondly, with First Citizens Bank in our local area, I mean, Gordon, you had some numbers, and well over 400, 500 units is what we put out in place in the marketplace. But me personally, through MHO and other uh, organizations, is well over 1,000 affordable units. Um, one of the things I'm passionate about right now is trying to find a way, and I, wanted to, I asked a question earlier, is we've, got a, uh, we've tended to attack the low-end area of the affordable housing, workforce housing and some of that. I've mentioned this to Kit Kramer. She's a ch uh, chamber executive director, and um, I really want to tackle this kind of empty bedrooms concept. And then what that concept is, is if you've got um, a lot of people out there who used to have a five, six person, four person household, and they're still living in the house, um, some people want to stay there, but there's others who absolutely want to downsize. And due to lack of affordable stock, and affordability comes in many different versions, um, they don't downsize which doesn't create stock that people are able to move up into. Because one of the things I really noticed in our mortgage numbers were, compared to other cities that we do a lot of mortgage business in, including Johnson City and others, the age group of around 28 to 35, I'm underrepresented in for newer mortgage opportunities from somebody in market who wants to stay in market. So I'd ask the question, what's going on there? Well, a lot of times they're leaving and they're going to Greenville, South Carolina, Spartanburg, Charlotte, Johnson City, one for affordability because they can, but two, it's a stock issue because what we're tending to see here is that um, people want to stay in those houses either. That's one option. They want to stay in them longer, but two, it's not affordable enough on the private market for them to move into something that they want to get to, which doesn't create that flow. So Gordon, that's one thing I'm kind of passionate about trying to help out in the future. Back to follow. <clears throat> uh, I got asked to come on the panel uh, yesterday afternoon, so I didn't have a chance to uh, get a lot of data. I do have some data. We, in turn, at Home Trust Bank have been around 90 years and have sponsored a variety of companies like MHO who have great plans, great leadership, uh, great board members that, in turn, provide some vision of trying to solve the low-income housing, affordable housing issue. Uh, in addition to that, we've probably financed various developers and projects, about 200 units that I found research on in the short time frame I was allotted. Uh, I'm sure the number is probably larger, but I don't want to misrepresent that number. Uh, and so we're happy to work with developers who in turn uh, are able to solve this issue. I'm not representing an institution right now. I'll pass on this question. 
Mine's even simpler than Brian's. I got asked yesterday afternoon. So my data comes directly from myself. Um, been in this market uh, for the past 20 years, but I can tell you in the last five years, uh, through my clients uh, building affordable housing units, we've done probably 20, 30 a year uh, as an individual. Uh, and that means most of my clients are smaller. They're not large developer track developers like kind of like Pat alluded to, like you'd find out in Greenville and Spartanburg and stuff like that. Uh, from Integra standpoint, you know, we are in those markets, but I don't have the data on that. But to me, a lot of times it's about more about that. It's about the individuals that has the uh, the little acre land that they we can try to carve up and put one or two units on on the market because my personal opinion, looking back over that, I think these private individual developers are doing a lot better job than some of the massive larger tracks because they're doing it quicker, and that's key. Every month that you go without affordable housing is an issue. So if I can do one a year, but I'm doing it in three to four months, that's a lot different than trying to put 40 units. That's going to take me three years to get on the market. So we just did on a small time. Can you talk a little bit about why those time frames are so different? Well, <clears throat> I think they're just more efficient in my personal opinion, but the, the clients that we deal with, uh, I think, are seasoned. They know they have it down to a science from an efficient, uh, efficiencies of it. They know what they can and cannot do. And it's, I mean, it's a cost thing. Uh, Case in point, uh, I have a 65-year-old native veteran come to my office yesterday. We had a six-lot subdivision that we've been working on for the last couple of years. We was down to the last lot. We built it. He just sold it. So we was discussing his next opportunity, and he says, I've been working on this eight-lot little development uh, that he bought uh, the land for $75,000. He was able to put two units in the very front because it fronted a road, so it had utilities. <laughs> Uh, so that was $10,000 a lot. That's affordable. That's how you get affordable units on the market as single structure housing. Well, then he just eluded to tell me that now for the next six units, it's going to cost me $125,000 worth of infrastructure for six units. That's another $35,000 a lot. So it's, you know, it's capitalism at its best. I can't, I've got to pass that money along. So therefore, those next eight, six houses are going to be higher. They're not going to be affordable at that point in time. Um, Jeff, if you could take the mic, and, and this can kind of go around to whoever's uh, interested, but just to kind of provide some context to, uh, I think that we hear um, about affordable housing from studied folks like Matthew Desmond and from our community that's severely lacking in housing and facing double, triple up, move out of county and do this sort of thing. Um, but I wonder from uh, a, I guess, community development, broader community development, economic development perspective, how this is affecting uh, your businesses, uh, your employees, um, your coworkers, uh, as well as some of these customers that you're serving. Um, let me let me give a, just a, I want to provide just a little bit of context for this um, with a slide. By May, and uh, so um, so f some of you folks. How's that? Okay. All right, so um, I was recently in touch with Patrick Bowen. Um, and some of you know that Patrick Bowen, uh, Bowen National Research, did our housing needs assessment and market analysis a few years ago, which I think in some ways was um, the, the trigger for far greater scrutiny on both public and private sectors in this community around the issues of affordable housing. Because it actually put into numbers the extent 
of the affordable housing needs in our community, all the way up to 120% of median income. So we're not just talking folks at the 30 and 50 and 60% of median income, but all the way up to 120% of median income. It led to, I don't know if this was a direct lead, but it led to um, Pat Carver chairing a, a task force of the Chamber of Commerce that surveyed our employers of our community, um, who uniformly were saying that this was affecting their businesses and their ability to attract businesses and employers because of the cost of housing. So Patrick and I have stayed in touch, um, and he recently did a targeted market study um, for what is um, a proposed um, tax credit program, uh, uh, application uh, coming in from the city of Asheville. Um, this would be um, something I can't, I'm not at liberty to talk about the project itself, but it is essentially an existing subsidized project that has reached the end of an original tax credit project, so it's looking to stay affordable for an additional 30 years. We want this kind of thing, right? So what he did is um, he, he, he basically surveyed um, not the entire community, but a large number of private sector and subsidized developments in the city of Asheville. And this is what he found. And um, if I can just, I'll just go over here, uh, maybe this thing, I'm not gonna try to figure that out. Um, if you can look over here. So this up here, you see, this is medium gross rent. Look at the medium two bedroom gross rent, $1,222. Medium gross rent, tax credit, $670. That's 60% AMI. And what Patrick said is that this is the greatest discrepancy of anywhere in the country between market rents and tax credit rents, which in his mind says that we have the greatest discrepancy in the lack of workforce housing in our community. In any place, in the entire country, the greatest gap between what a working household can afford and what the market rents are affording. So just as the context for how it affects your institutions and what's going on, we have some data that suggests that our housing gap is certainly at our very, very low income levels, but it is also extensively all the way up the ladder to the people who are the employees of your business, the employees of your business, the employees of your business, the employees of your clients, um, our school teachers, our firefighters, um, everyone in our community is affected by this. And so this is, um, this is, this is data, by the way, that, that is current um, as of last month. Jeff, I want to thank you for referencing one thing in there, and that was the uh, study we did at the chamber. And I want to recognize Ed Manning, who's in here also. Ed was uh, instrumental in getting that done and provided a large leadership level from doing that. And, Kid, I can't remember how many responses do we, I mean, just uh, approximately. It was. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot, though. I mean, more than a thousand, right? Thousands? Okay, we'll just say thousands. And it gave us a great um, representation from our community, and it was a great project as a business community to reach out and say what's going on. So that, then, you know, it mirrored the data here of what we saw and what people were saying. And has, is, I'll ask this question, too. Has anyone noticed that traffic, traffic has increased? I mean, good gracious, over the last, I've been here now for 12 years, the second stint, I've lived here twice, but traffic the last five years has really increased. And I had to start, you know, looking at this study and everything else. And there was a study done by University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, it must have been six, seven years ago now that we did at MHO. And it said the two largest areas of ingress, egress, meaning morning traffic and afternoon traffic during a work week were Wilmington, North Carolina MSA and the Asheville, North Carolina MSA. So I looked at it as a microcosm too. And to your point of the question is, how does it impact our workforce? I've got, um, I work downtown, I'm a city of Asheville resident, um, and I've got 26 people in my building downtown. And I looked around and I did a survey and I said, how many of you are in the city of Asheville? How many of you are in Buncombe County? And then how many of you live outside of Buncombe County? Out of those 20 some people, 80% lived outside of Buncombe County. There was only five of us, including myself, who were residents of the city of Asheville. Now, that's a microcosm. And the reason it was, my average age in that building is 36 years. 
So I've got a lot of younger folks who are trying to make a living. They want to a good, secure job because that's one thing that people really look for in, a, in any type of housing is they want safety and security. That's the real number one driver. And they said, I just can't afford to be here, but I want somewhere that's safe and I want somewhere that's secure. And the housing stock I found here doesn't give me that, so I've got to live somewhere else. So now my traffic and my commute is up. So then I said, okay, I've got 12, actually 13 more facilities here in Buncombe County proper. And I asked the same question out of all those. 112 people, 78% live outside of Buncombe County. Let's think about that. And what was the primary reason? Housing. I can find cheaper housing stock. I can make it work with gas where it is right now. I'm willing to pay higher gas bills. I'm willing to have more wear and tear on my car. I'm willing to do that because my number one need is safety and security, and I know I can get that at a lower price, and I can afford to do some other things I want to do in my life. That's how it's impacting employers like me. And what that does a lot of times is that road piece is I've had branches where we've had to get a little bit leaner. I can't open them on time sometimes. I can't get there. The other thing I worry about is the carbon footprint we're leaving. The pollution and the smog that's out there right now because cars that sit idling in traffic and aren't moving absolutely contribute to non-optimal conditions for what we want to see in the future for that. So I'll leave it there. I appreciate the um, spotlight that you're putting on it. And what you just said, Pat, is that this, you know, we put affordable housing into a housing crisis box and kind of leave it there. But when we hear residents begin to say, hey, stop development because the traffic's so bad, I think that that connection may not be what we're seeing. Um, as you just heard from Pat, that a lot of what's driving the traffic is the lack of housing and the lack of affordable housing within the city limits. Um, and going more broadly into uh, keeping the environment strong and then keeping our economy strong. Are, are, are the folks who are gonna work here be able to live here and share that wealth within our community. So I, I appreciate that. And Jeff, bringing the Bowen report back around, when this report came out, um, I think it was a big shock to the system uh, to see this uh, vacancy rate of less than 1% in all of the income ranges except the very highest. Um, and while those numbers have begun to shift a little bit, this tells a very uh, stark tale. And I hadn't realized that we had the biggest discrepancy in the country. Um, and if, if you take nothing else away today, understand that that's something that people need to know when we're talking about the affordable housing issue. I want to start to move towards uh, some of y'all's ideas around how we're going to be able to sub substantially move the needle on this stuff and where you feel your institutions can play a role in that. We've got a, a laundry list of potential solutions and uh, I don't think there's any one that's gonna solve it. Uh, that's another thing that we've learned through uh, years and years of attacking this problem is that the menu of things that we have to do is very long. Um, so I just wanted to kind of turn it over to y'all. I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about how you and your institutions can begin to move the needle on this. We've got some ideas in the community that are evolving around community land trusts, um, around cooperative housing, around some of these other models that have been effective in other places, but we just don't see them yet here. So the, the programs that the, the city and the county uh, and the state have put forward that I've been using and been familiar with uh, have been favorable financing type of, of arrangements uh, where the, the debt is financed, say, at 2%, and uh, we'll take a lien behind the lender and then after a period of 20, 30 years, the principal and the interest is then forgiven. The interest is deferred. So it comes in as additional equity into the project from the bank's viewpoint, uh, which helps the developer and then also helps the return on the investment. Working with the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, they also have a couple of different funds uh, that are available to various developers that also can be favorable financing or grants that also uh, help a developer in that aspect. The problem we have in our area is the topography. There's a limited amount that they can build on. They are, therefore, because of that, there's higher demand for that property, and higher demand means higher prices. So when you start with a high land cost, that, that starts you from uh, a negative position to begin with when you are comparing yourselves with Johnson City or Greenville, South Carolina, uh, for example. So we use those programs and make those programs known to the developers and encourage them to start talking to uh, the various governmental entities to help the projects. 
and ours is the same way on a smaller scale. We've used the same programs, uh, assisting with the, the developers and stuff like that. Uh, I know <coughs> Integra basically is just a new name for making banks. Been around for 95 years. They changed their name in order because we branched out and bought some uh, banks in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, in those communities, you know, they're real tied to the community. So I know that they, I've seen some of the stuff that they've done internally. It might have been a little uh, above our policy from that standpoint, but if it is good for the community and they see the need uh, from that standpoint, they have went outside their boxes with that to make it favorable in order to make it work. But the bottom line at the same time is it's still we're regulated. We have to make it sure it's a credit worthy uh, decision. And you know, how can we do that? Can we spread the risk amongst amongst ourselves. I was thinking back and I'm trying to remember the project, uh, God, it's been 15 years ago in South Asheville that a group of banks got together on that apartment building. Uh, I don't hear any more of that. I don't, you know, uh, it is going to be a private public win. I mean, you've got to do that from that standpoint, uh, whether it's small scale or large scale, and we're going to have to come together with that. One of the things we've done too is uh, my institution is a little bit larger in scale, and you know we cover a couple different states, and uh, we invest heavily in KHEC and also in the North Carolina Housing Fund, and those are uh, CDCs and agencies that are out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, one of the things that I'm, I'm really trying to work on is uh, I've got one person in my bank who invests those funds for us, and where are those funds going to? Well, they get spread across the state, and you know where needs are, and then really what I'm trying to encourage is. Okay, if Wilmington and Asheville have the highest ingress, egress, and the affordable housing is driving some of that, Mike, you know, and then his name is Mike. I'm like, Mike, you know, I'm a little bit selfish. I love Asheville. I love our community. How do we get more of that money to flow here? And one thing I'll be glad to say is we've diverted now. Um, it was about 5% of our funds were going there through KHEC or the North Carolina Housing Fund. Now we're getting close to 25%. And the other 25 are going to Wilmington right now because we feel they're underserved. Mm -hmm. So instead of attracting it as a broadband approach across the state, we've kind of targeted some, and what we call it might not be the right terminology, but underserved where funding needs to happen more. So hopefully that's helpful too. You know, we've, um, the good news um, that we heard some today earlier is that, you know, um, mountain housing habitat have historically been very active developers in our community, both using public funds, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit by MHO, um, the, some public funds, but a lot of private sector um, involvement in Habitat to make those projects work, um, and that they're still committed to doing so. The bad news, um, we have not had one new Low Income Housing Tax Credit unit open in the city of Asheville for families in five years. Not one, not one, zero. In fact, in the next two years, we will have a grand total, so it'll be a seven year total of 32 units of low income housing tax credit units open for occupancy in the city of Asheville. And we're probably another three to four years until we see hopefully the Lee Walker Heights project get funded and open, which will be 96 replacement units and about 110 new units. So with a need in our community, at the 60% of AMI level um, of 500 units a year, we, we are in single digits in terms of meeting that need. So the it is clear, and my experience with the city of Asheville says that we need more local solutions. We certainly want to support the expansion of these programs. They make great long-lasting projects possible. But, you know, legislation in this particular, even if it's bipartisan, in this particular national environment, I don't give it much of a hope of going anywhere, of it expanding opportunities for low-income households in our, in our country. We need local solutions. So the city of Asheville stepped up, and the city of Asheville Council, supported by its voters, approved $25 million of affordable housing bond money to be spent in this community. Now it's going to be in the next six and a half years. Approved it in, in November. So 
I think we need, really need to turn our attention, whether it's, it's all going to be public-private partnerships. We're very well aware of that. The private sector is not going to do it alone, but the public sector isn't going to do it alone either. So let's look at 25 million for just a second. And I, want to, and I don't want to dominate the mic, but I do want to share this with you. If the investment was $10,000 by the public sector in a unit, we could have 2,500 more affordable housing units in the next five years. If the investment was $20,000 a unit, which has been the standard pretty much for a reasonable investment by the city of Asheville to help create an affordable housing unit that would be affordable for 20 to 30 years, that would create 1,000 new affordable housing units affordable to households at 80% of median income and less for a minimum of 20 years in our community over the next five years. I think we now need to be thinking about that context and saying, okay, who is going to do the development and how will our local partners, our finance partners in this, come together to help make this happen. And we hear all the time, and, and, and I know, take it to heart, that it's a very difficult regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. So we need to be looking at how do we create local, non-regulated pools of funds in order to create these investments in a way that makes sense with credible developers in our community that are going to do and are going to be concerned about our community. We don't have a legal basis right now to force people to do this. Although many communities throughout the country in states that allow it have done inclusionary zoning and made it mandatory, we're not going to do that in North Carolina. However, we can do voluntary inclusionary zoning, and I think that we need to be looking at models of doing this with local developers who really care about the community and want to make things happen. And, and I'm really, by the way, I have some, I had a handout here just to throw it out to you. Um, I won't go into any depth because there's a lot to do here. But I think that if we listen to Bruce Toller, who's here later on about the missing middle, and we start talking with our local developers about how we can make 10, 20, 30, and 50% of their units affordable and start looking at the public investment in those affordable houses, I think we have an opportunity to really make things happen in this community. I don't think it's going to happen without that kind of partnership. I think Jeff just dropped a lot of knowledge and, and perspective right there, and I'd love to hear your uh, just kind of feedback on, on that. But um, outside of the city of Asheville, um, there's 96 new units that are going to be going in across from the Ingalls on Highway 70. Um, there's uh, the Madison County uh, project that you were discussing earlier. Uh, Henderson County is going to see some tax credit un units. Um, but the numbers as far as within the city of Asheville, we're in competition with all of these other projects. Um, and we've never gotten more than one a year, uh, So if we get that. so. So while some of these are happening in other communities, and they're very valuable in those communities, um, they're not, they haven't been happening here for five years. But I think it's fair to say, Gordon, that I think we've seen more of the uh, awards go to outside of city of Asheville in Buncombe County versus the city itself. And then we've got to ask ourselves, what's the reason that's occurring? And I don't know the answer to that, but we've got to ask it. I mean, what, and I think as a community, we need to say, what's the reason? Let's get, what's the obstacle? because we've absolutely got it going on in Buncombe County. And there's been low income tax credits, not to the extent we want to see, but more of the awards are going on in the county versus the city. So now we've got to see how do we make that happen inside the city? Well, we have a regional, we have a regional housing consortium and Mark Burroughs is here. He's the vice chair of that body. And that is uh, four counties coming together to determine which direction to allocate our federal home dollars. And a lot of the low-income housing tax credit awards, uh, one of the big scoring pieces of that is how much local support you have for your project. So as we choose which community to direct these federal home funds into, that has a lot to do with where the funds are going to land. Um, and the spirit of that body has been to try to equitably move that money around. Um, anyone have any thoughts on Jeff's comments? There's a lot of information. The, you know, <coughs> From my perspective, the I really believe we got, we got to get rid of the boundaries uh, from that standpoint and start looking at like Pat, Pat said with his employees, is it's not a national thing, it's not a county thing. I mean, it's an MSA piece to it, uh, and 
God's not making any more land, and we got to deal with our topography. So there's issues that we have to, to deal with, and I feel that if we're going to do that, then get rid of the boundaries, make it more affordable in some way that if we have to push out units outside uh, the city limit, outside the county, whatever, because I was one of those people. I drove into Asheville every day for many years because Henderson County was cheaper from that standpoint. Uh, but if we have, if we do that, then we've got to look at our transportation issues as well. We've got to make it affordable for these individuals, young, old, whatever, to get in and out of these markets because it is going to be an impact to our businesses. Whether they work inside the city or they don't, the restaurants, the hotels, you know, our businesses, uh, they're not going to be able to support it from a housing issue. And by doing that, you know, if we can make it, whether it's, you know, from the standpoint of, uh, the legality of issues that we can change from a development standpoint or subsidizing just because it's not inside the city limits we need to come together as a group and say you know is it better for all of us because we're moving in and we're using those jobs inside the city or the county but we don't have to be living here as well so i think you just got to look at that uh, and see if there's a better way to do that as a group well, from, from that perspective lacy um, the idea of improving all that transit transportation, it generally falls to government to do, whether it's state government, federal government, local government, to improve the transportation mechanisms. And so the question of the role of private sector and private sector lenders within that, how do you see that? Why? Why does it have to be that way? If I'm, a, if I'm a, an entrepreneur and I can figure out a way to uh, develop a private economical bus and knowing that I got the support of my city, my county, that's going to put some developments in an area, then I'm going to run a private transportation to that area. If I see a need, if I see a profitability, I mean, I think we have to look outside the box that we've been looking in for too many years. You're not going to fix it with, you know, the same mentality that we've looked at stuff, you know, uh, in the past. I mean, uh, I got a sophomore, it's a daughter uh, at NC State, very passionate about homelessness. We've done a lot of work here in town. I took a group to Atlanta four years ago of middle school and high school boys. Now you walk the streets of Atlanta and you'll see homelessness. We don't have that here. That's the impact that you've got to get to. You've got to change that, mi that mind that early on just to look out for some different kind of avenues and saying, what about this way? It doesn't have to be the same scenarios that we're looking at. To start with, it's kind of a three-legged stool, though education, transportation, housing. Starts with early childhood education, goes on up from there. Transportation is a part of it, then housing. So you gotta have the three-legged stool working and you gotta have members of all those communities talking together. Um, Gordon, your specific question about it's typically falling on government for transportation, you're, you're, you're right, it has. Where we need the public-private partnership to work on that is if you've got, let's say, a transportation hub for public transportation, Generally, city, municipal, state, whatever it is, comes in, grades out the land, does everything else. That cuts out half of the cost. And for a developer, if a developer wants to come in in partnership and put housing directly next door or in our early childhood education center or educational opportunities or things like that, um, if it's, uh, uh, let's say, it's uh, roadway transportation, generally they grade out the road. So then a developer can come in then and the infrastructure is much less to put, much less uh, costly to put in. So what we need to do is start talking more in partnership forms instead of projects. Yeah. That's a really good point. There's an example of that right now. The, the city has moved towards uh, trying to create those partnerships through um, changing over city-owned land into housing, uh, into future housing. We're doing that on Hilliard Avenue right now in uh, partnership with Chip Cassinger and are going to establish a 50-year affordability period as a result. Um, and the number of units is out of my head right now, but it's a mixed income development. Um, and again, it's an innovative, never before tried partnership here. And it's the first of many that we need to do. And I'm encouraged to hear that you're, that, that financing can come in for that sort of thing into some innovative models. Because doing a 50-year guaranteed affordability is not something we've ever seen here before. Um, the city property, great ideas and everything else. 
what we found early on was some of the city properties had some EPA problems in there. So you've got where you used to have uh, the mechanics rooms, you used to have everything else. And a lot of cities, that's where we put poor people on was properties that were less desirable. Mm -hmm. That's not really what we want to do. And I've mentioned this to Jeff before, is maybe something we look at too as part of the bond referendum is looking at can we clean up some of these properties through some of the bond funds and then make it more desirable to put either housing, educational centers, whatever it is, transport, whatever we want to do as a city, but take some of that money to clean them up first because what's happening right now is a lot of times um, the city's doing a one-off. And let's say you've got a piece of property and a developer wants to come in and say, I'll develop the property for you. Well, the property's being discounted because of the EPA work that has to go into it. So you're if a neighboring property value, you're a neighboring property owner, your property automatically then just became less. Is that the right thing to do? Where if we can take some of the bond funds, clean it up, that keeps property values up, that keeps more of the system working together, but it's just an idea that's out there too. Yeah, being able to have that effective site prep. I want to open it up to questions from out here. We've uh, with this session supposed to run for about another 20 minutes. I've got more questions that I could throw out, but I'm guessing y'all do too. So we'll start with Thank you. I appreciate all of you being up there um, and answering or talking about this. Um, I represent a general contractor, and we've built over 11,000 uh, affordable units over the years in North Carolina and South Carolina. And we're, we're well known for, for doing that. One of the things that I think you have to realize is today's environment. Today's environment is that there is construction going on all over North Carolina. There is a shortage of workers everywhere. There is a shortage of materials, certain materials, and there is an incredible cost that has gone up just recently because of all the hurricanes and natural disasters. That being said, you have to look at our topography, and several of you have mentioned the topography. It is very expensive to build here. So the point is, what can we do to incentivize developers, sometimes they're developers and general contractors are the same people, um, to build these, I mean, it is a capitalist society, so you know, it is, they're not gonna do it for free. They, they have a, a passion for it, but how do you do that so that they can get the money for the topography that they have to deal with. You're having to, you need to pay people and, and getting the workers and getting the subs to come to the, it's, it's a very serious problem all over the country, but particularly. Are you talking about uh, governmental incentives? Uh, private no, I'm talking incentives. about private sector incentives, the city's incentives. Um, I mean, we do have, I mean, the 9% tax credit is so competitive that people don't want to even use it anymore. And like you said, we're not getting uh, our fair share, so to speak. But there is the 4% tax credit. And there are other alternatives. But what can the city do? You've got that money, and you're trying to figure out, I think, and I sit on a lot of these uh, councils, what can you do for the developers here to incentivize them to go above and beyond and to be able to afford to build the units? That's a great question. I'm going to give this one to Jeff. So let's, let's talk for a second about what we, what we can do. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is what council has decided we will do, but I'll say talk about what we can do. City of Asheville can use bond money to purchase property and to lease it for a 50-year term or a 70-year term or a 100-year term to a developer who would build affordable housing on it. And the lease payment can be negotiated. It does not need to be um, market rate lease. It can be 10% of, of, uh, of uh, net, net, uh, net income, for example. It can, be, um, it can be a dollar a year for the first 15 years. It can be negotiated based upon the outcomes that the developer can provide. If the developer is willing to be transparent in their cost and share with the city that transparent cost factor and also say what the developer would make if the project were a market rate project, then we can have a conversation about what kind of subsidy is necessary in order to make the developer relatively whole. 
Now, I will say relatively whole, because we know that in today's market environment here, where your median rent for a two-bedroom is over 1200 a month, and your affordable rent for a household of 60% of median income is under $700 a month, it's going to be very difficult to make someone 100% whole. But we have had successful conversations with developers who have accepted Asheville's incentives for a percentage of their units being affordable. And in fact, we'll talk about this at a subsequent session today where Kirk Booth is going to talk about a project where 100% of his units, private sector developer, 100% of his units affordable. So that is one place we can partner. Second place we can partner is through the kind of thing that, that uh, was mentioned earlier, where we can essentially invest money that looks, smells, and feels like equity, but in fact is structured as debt. And that just doesn't need to be in a tax credit project. Again, that can be a quid pro quo for the affordable outcomes that the city is looking for. So you come to the city today under existing rules today. You come to the city today and you say, I'm going to make 50% of my units affordable to households of 60% of median income. We can write you a loan at $20,000. We, I'm not we anymore, but it's a little hard to separate oneself from that. It wasn't that long ago. The city can write you a loan at 2% um, at interest only for the term that you will agree to keep it affordable. and rebate property taxes, and rebate your, um, we say rebate, by the way, it's not legal to rebate. Give you, give you a grant equal to the amount of your property taxes for a period of years, and give you a grant that would pay for your permit fees. I have one comment regarding Margie, is basically every project is gonna be different. Every location is gonna be different. So therefore, everything needs to be logical. So you either make it more profitable, you make it less costly. It's, it's that simple. So it's on the expense saving side, I think that you're gonna have a bigger impact. I mean, there's all kind of things that's not logical in certain developments. I'm thinking of apartment complex development that happened many years ago here, and I was on the groundbreaking. I had no, no involvement in the financing or anything, but I was on the groundbreaking day, and the person got up was talking about affordable units, and I started doing a quick calculation, I was like, oh, you're really happy about eight units over 300. I was like, that's not a four. I mean, that's, you know, that's landscaping. That's, you know. So those are the offsets that you've got to be willing to look at. You know, why do we need every road to be able to turn a tractor trailer around? There's no impact for that. Why do we need a sidewalk to nowhere where we need 40 foot buffers of landscaping when if it means that I can get three more affordable units in there? I think it's going to be on the expense side is what it needs to be looked at. Well, that was that's exactly where I was where I was thinking are there things that we can do to speed up the process you mentioned paying for permits um, but instead I mean time is money literally for developer developers are there ways that we could speed up the process for them to get things built get them on the ground so they're income producing because that would literally also help reduce expense which would be a career and that's certainly within the city's control to be able to do. It's not easy, but it's within their control. So if we could brainstorm ways that we could find ways to reduce, we, we want safe places, but can are there things that we can do that would, uh, would speed up the process and reduce the expense? Great question. The mayor convened a uh, development task force around this and brought a, uh, I, don't, I can't even remember, it's a dozen or more developers to the table, and they have, a, they have an ongoing working group to change development services policies to do exactly what you're talking about right now. Oh, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, I, guess, I guess, you know, as, as you've had a chance to take a deep dive into those processes and see um, kind of what we have to do in regards to transparency, uh, what we have to do with the existing staffing. Um, I, I guess what, I, what I'm hearing from Jeff is, uh, hey, the government's coming to the table with all this stuff, um, and I'm hearing that 
private sector is, is raring to go, but has some uh, restrictions right now and some things holding them back in regards to labor force, in regards to land cost, in regards to permitting processes, and we know that that time is real money, that every month something gets delayed, that that's just bleeding money. I understand that too. Um, so when we have the governmental entity uh, kind of coming with, with this array of initiatives and we hear these other needs, I think that there's this, this, uh, this sense that, well, if the government could just do more, or in some cases, I guess you're, you might be saying do less, uh, um, in regards to loosening some policy restrictions around open space, around buffers, around sidewalk requirements, around some of these livability things that have risen more and more to the top. Um, so. So you may remember the Coggins Farm discussion. I mean, initially zoned for a thousand units, and it ended up after community input going to a hundred units. So, so, and the cost per unit. I mean, I don't have to know anything else about that to know that what that does to the cost per unit and the affordability. And so, it, if there's ways in the process as well. I mean, I know people are passionate. Eh, we have a we have more we have an abundance of passion in this community, and people everybody wants to share their thoughts, but there at some point we have to recognize that we've got to get more into the market, and and faster in order to meet needs. All right. Um, any y'all want to respond? To And uh, Kit, thanks for being an impromptu panel member here to this morning. I'm going to throw a complete different spin on all of this. Um, I am originally from South Africa about 23 years ago. And during apartheid, we had a housing crisis for a certain racial group that had to be solved. Um, basically, they brought into the country to get sugarcane. They settled next to the city, and as the city expanded, they were bulldozed, their shacks, and they had to leave. So <clears throat> they hired me at the time, I'm an architect, a developer, and I also do construction, to design a master plan for this group. And how it was done is the cabinet ministers, because they had interim gov governments before they got to where they are today, would go with me on the weekends to the different uh, communities. We would present the designs that I came up with, uh, and there were certain income <coughs> parameters, three different groups, and there was some subsidy to, of course, repay for the uh, injustice part. Now, I have looked in this country uh, at the housing authority process that goes through developers. I've pulled the documents, the original <coughs> Documents, documents that are submitted and analyze them. And then you look at the building cost and you look at the eventual cost and I just shake my head. And then you have the tax credit project that comes after that. Now wait, let me finish, let me finish. So the way we did it there is I was hired, the government directly provided the land. We went directly to builders. And the cost was analyzed by the government's quality surveyors to make sure that it was correct. I, I went to national television. We didn't do hundreds of houses. We did thousands of houses. Okay? And when I left and came here, they continued that process. And they would tell a contractor, this is what it is. You can make $7,000 a house. That's it. And that's how we did it. So the question is, uh, just answer the question, you that It has to go, come directly from either the government or directly from the city. Cut out the developers. And I'm a developer. Go directly to the contractor. Okay. We've got a different model to talk about.
as I said earlier, I took this group to Atlanta. Seven days, every other day, we split our group in half. We walked the streets of Atlanta and handed out bags of food, repurposed food from restaurants. The other half, we went into the housing complexes, a building of 20 units that would, five of them would show condemned stickers on them. I mean, I wouldn't walk, I wouldn't let my kid walk up the steps to the knock on the door to pray for the individual that would come out with four or five kids. I mean, that's hardcore. But as we walked around these neighborhoods, I remember coming to a corner, beautiful architectural building, standing vacant. And it looked like it was a fire at some point in time, so the guts was majority gone. And my son's been around me for a long time, and he's like, that's a waste. I was like, yeah, we're three blocks from downtown, from that standpoint. But it was in the northwest corner where they've pushed all the homeless to. I said, so what would you do with it? He says, well, Jason, his brother is a cop. Why don't the city get in there and gut that building, put it back to its place, and house teachers, firemen, and police officers on the bottom level, and then the whole second floor could be as cheap or free of affordable housing you want to make it. But it rose that whole corner block. It's only going to take that. So by, in my opinion, if those things are out there and or properties, land is available like that, I think it's a great model is to go in there and say, okay, we're going to become it. Whether, you know, if you can't get the private sector to, to get on board to make a smaller uh, income level to be supportive of your community, then you develop that community inside your organization and you do it yourself with the, your... The government has developed... Can I say something on that? Uh, let's, let's have the panel first. <coughs> So entrepreneurial profit is uh, a driving force with developers. Uh, they, in turn, are investing their money to make money. Uh, they're not there to donate it. Uh, they will sponsor things uh, and events uh, uh, to uh, be good stewards within the community. <clears throat> but uh, to uh, tell a developer you're, you're only going to make a certain amount of money, then it's up to them to decide whether to move forward with the project. From a lending standpoint, that's really between the developer and their investors uh, to do that, not necessarily the, the banks in that decision. Uh, because we are regulated and we get appraisals and engineers to look at the plan specs and drawings and the budgets, uh, and after looking at many of them, like Lacey and Pat and myself, we kind of understand if, uh, you know, cost per foot and, and the other soft cost that goes along with the project, and entrepreneurial profit ranging from 10 to 15% is usually standard, and that's what an appraiser is going to use uh, and so we'll finance up to a certain percentage of cost, not to exceed a certain percentage of the appraisal, and we're sort of bound by that and, and those regulations. Uh, how do you all feel the, uh, the, the, the market would be affected if government as developer became a thing, and the government became a competitor in the land buying process? You, you know, it's an interesting concept, but I'm going to first start with the uh, capping of the profit that you were talking about earlier. Um, one of the things that could get in the way of that is exactly what I think it's Margie. Is that did I get your name right there? Margie said right now is cost of materials have significantly risen just in the last six to eight months, and they are going to rise dramatically into the next year, and with a shortage of labor. So if you're going to commit as a developer to say I'm only going to take this amount of profit and I'll cap it here, something's got to give because that just won't work. And then there's no reason to make do the work. So if government comes in, Gordon, and um, in, in essence, that's what some of these programs are. Um, if you look at um, tax credits and other things, those are sometimes private funds mingled with public funds mingled, whatever. But the bottom line is government's coming in and providing some type of capital injection in there, whether it's in the form of buying land, whether it's in the form of a soft second, whether it's in the form of uh, uh, tax credit type things. It's all the same principle. Um, so we're doing that right now. It's just what forms are we willing to accept in the future? Um, I, I, I want to be able to continue, but we are bumping up against the clock, and I promised Justin that I wouldn't go over. Um, so if you are willing to stick around a little longer, I think I know Dee had a question that she just kind of came in here at the, at the last minute. Um, 
And uh, before we finish up, too, I want to recognize that Council Member Julie Mayfield is here, um, and she's also a member of the Housing Community Development Committee, and we'll continue to do that after December when I won't continue to do that. So um, feel free to direct your governmental questions to her. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you today for coming here, and this is obviously a, a set of questions that um, we keep pulling at in an effort to get to these solutions. <laughs>